Good morning, and thank you very much for joining our Monday morning lecture today. Today we have an absolutely amazing lecture, almost a detective story. Our speaker today, Ten, uh, Dr. Ten Kiwi, is an economist running his own advisory firm. Prior to that, Dr. Ten spent many years in the investment industry as an economist, focused in the financial markets and global economies. Dr. Ten started off his career in 1988 as a journalist with the daily newspaper Business Times in Singapore. And that was after he secured his PhD economics from the University of East Anglia in Britain. Despite spending most of his career in the business world, he continues to teach undergraduates on a part-time basis. And he is speaking to us today because of his absolutely amazing Shansi Du Bronze's inheritance from his father that he inherited in 1970s. Dr. Tan will share with us uh, the journey he went through trying to figure out the regions. Dr. Tan, we are absolutely, um, it's a detective story, so we know about it, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, I shall share screen because I've got slides for you all to see. <clears throat> okay, good morning again. Um, the title is uh, My Personal Journey with San Sing Dui. San Sing Dui is, uh, I'll, I'll do two things today. I will touch on the significance of San Sing Dui, and then I'll explain how I got uh, my San Sing Dui mask and other bronzes. Okay. First of all, uh, for example, this is a bronze head, okay, uh, which, I, which, well, my father acquired in the, in the 1970s. It's, uh, it's about one foot tall, okay? And uh, when he first got it, we were just wondering what it was. I mean, I've never seen anything like that before. Okay, okay. Now, a few months ago in March, China announced a major additional finding from this place called San Tsing Dui, uh, where, where, where the source of all these funny, funny hates appeared. Okay, now, after a few more months, they release more findings. And this is uh, another head which they found, quite big. They found a, a gold foil mask, and of course, a few other bronze uh, uh, figures. So this is all very exciting for the Chinese and maybe for the world, uh, those who are interested in history. You know? Well, first of all, let's begin. Where is San Sing Dui? San Chengdu is, oh, is near the city of Chengdu, okay? And uh, it is uh, maybe about north, north, uh, north east of uh, Chengdu area, okay? Now, now I'll tell you about the significance of San Chengdu. But before I go there, please uh, read this. I'm not an expert in uh, San Sing Dui, but I mean, this is what I have read over the past few years. Now, first look at the human civilization, how old it is. Well, there's ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient India, ancient China, then ancient Egypt, which is much older than ancient China, and then Mesopotamia, which is uh, all ancient Sumer or what? today's Iraq. So it goes back to about 3,500 uh, years old. Now, according for a long time, there was this view of the, that Chinese dynasties follow one line, one branch, okay? The Neolithic, then Xia, then Shang, Western Chao, all the way down to today, okay? That's been the view for many, many years. So this is the view for many years. 
up to 1986. There's this uh, Neolithic culture, then the Xia dynasty, the Shang dynasty, and then from there all the way down to uh, the latest uh, Qing dynasty or CCP or what you want to call it. In 1929, they found a place, uh, they call it the Shu Kingdom, okay? Which is uh, not much was found there, uh, only the, the borders of a, of a city and all that. And before 1986, um, they felt that it was not a significant uh, society, okay? Um, so they left it as that. But uh, in 1986, you know, this single branch history of China was questioned. Why? Because at Sansing Dui, they came across two pits of a lot of uh, artifacts, uh, elephant tusks, bronzes, uh, jades, uh, uh, some human remains. And then they were astounded because they didn't expect uh, this place here, Sansing Dui, to have uh, such sophisticated bronzes. Okay. And when they found all these sophisticated bronzes at San Suing Di, they thought that, well, it must be maybe uh, uh, the same time as uh, the Shang Dynasty, which is around 1600 onwards. Okay, this is the Shang Dynasty, and this part here is San Suing Dui. Okay, so for, for, for some time, they thought that, okay, San Suing Di is very sophisticated. But they are probably as old as the Shang Dynasty, okay, which is 1600 BC. Now they they normally they like to use bronze as a as a yardstick, because to them, uh, if a society is able to uh, make sophisticated, beautiful bronzes, and for religious or for rituals, it must uh, have advanced in a certain. Uh, category of sophistication. So they thought that, well, Sansing Dui is uh, quite sophisticated. For example, this bronze elephant, it was uh, found in 1975, okay? And it was discovered in Hunan. Uh, and this is uh, actually a, a wine vessel. You pour the wine in here, and then the, the, the you can, this is a spout. We can pour the wine out of this. So to them, this is a mark of sophistication for the Shang Dynasty. And in uh, Sun Tzu there were also a lot of similar things. Okay, uh, funny enough, my father also had a elephant uh, bronze. Uh, this is the one he had, and it's much bigger. It's about uh, two feet long. And by arrived in Singapore in 1971. So, I mean, to us then it was, it means nothing. It's just another piece of artwork. But there's a significant because my father got it in 1971. Whereas the previous elephant I showed you in 1975, no, it, was, it was the first elephant ever, shaped elephant they ever found. Bronzes are very rare, and very expensive. For example, this 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 uh, zoo, which is a uh, wine vessel, wine container, was uh, sold in March two zero one seven for thirty three million dollars. Bronzes are rare, expensive because you see, every time a an emperor defeats in another, in another emperor, they'll take all their bronzes, melt it down, and cast and make his own. So the number of bronzes sort of disappear. Whereas maybe things like uh, uh, porcelain, you can't, you no point uh, smashing it because it's cheap to make new uh, porcelain. Okay, whereas bronze at that time was considered very rare and it was maybe as precious as gold. Now, the discovery of Sun Tzu suggests that Chinese history had two origins, two parallel branches. Okay, remember I told you before. Longshan culture, which is what has always been believed right up to today. But in 1986, after discovering Sanzuindi, they found that, oh, Sanzuindi actually was the 
son of Shu Kingdom, and Shu Kingdom was the son of the Baudun culture. So both were equally sophisticated. Okay, so this is a that, that was the revelation in 1986 that Sun Xingdui, which was as sophisticated as Shang Dynasty, uh, actually shows that there are two parallel branches of Chinese history. The Neolithic culture, which is you know, the original of the well-known branch, okay, what they had was settlements, uh, but uh, no sophisticated bronzes or, or, of, or artwork. Okay, the kind of artwork they have, they had were things like that, jade, pottery, quite, 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 quite simple. Okay, when they found Bowden, Bowden, Bowden culture was the other branch. Okay, again, maybe it was too old, too far back. They couldn't find anything, uh, any sophisticated artwork from this line as well. But at San Xingdui, they found a lot of unusual objects. And of course, the most famous one is the, uh, the mask, the bronze mask. In fact, they found 57 bronze masks, uh, all, all different sizes. Some are really big, okay? There's one that's 2.6 million, 2.6 meter tall, uh, standing bronze band, okay? And then there's another one, almost four meter tall bronze tree. So it was uh, uh, a revelation to them that uh, the, the, the Chinese San Xingdui or the people at San Xingdui were able to uh, create such artworks. Like I said, some masks were huge. This is just to show you how big it can be. And uh, so now the question is, where did this San Xingdui people come from? So there are two interesting theories, okay? One is, well, some people say that, hey, the masks and that look like those from Inca culture, from South America, maybe from Egypt. And that's because they all around the same latitude. Maybe there's some similarities. And some people postulated that, oh, maybe it's something to do with ancient aliens because uh, they have very, uh, you know, the, the theory about these ancient aliens that, people from outer space or beings from outer space came down to Earth and helped to uh, human beings along. Because one of the very unusual masks had these protruding eyes. I mean, this is not, not very unusual. You know? So what is it? But, okay, those ancient aliens say that, well, this protruding, protruding, protruding eyes, actually human beings' depiction of things like you know, uh, night goggles, all the type of uh, uh, eyewear that surgeons use. So maybe these ancient aliens were actually very sophisticated people. They came down, they were using such things. And the, the, the ancient Sanskritic people depict uh, them as like in this mask. So that's the interesting part. Now, Recent radiocarbon dating, recent as in the past 10 years, found that actually San Xingdi culture existed before Erlu Tou culture. Erlu Tou culture is the, the first branch, and even before Shang Dynasty. Okay, they found that okay, this San Xingdi is supposed to start around 2100, and Erlu Tou started around 1900 BC. So, you see, this is the first branch of Chinese history. Remember I told you before? And this is the second branch. Initially, they thought San Xingdui and the Shang Dynasty were about the same time. But tests have shown that no, a lot of these uh, organic remains could uh, date back to the even before early Tou period. So that means San Xingdui is as old as early Tou and way before Xia and Shang Dynasty. So that is another theory. Now the question is, maybe it explains why the Sun Xingdui bronzes were more sophisticated than the Erlu Tau bronzes. For instance, Sun Xingdui bronzes were like this, quite sophisticated, whereas the Erlu Tau bronzes were quite simple in design, easier to make. Another example, 
sensitive bronze, quite intricate design, whereas the other two bronzes were quite simple. Sensitive bronzes again, the, the wine vessels were very intricate, whereas the other two bronzes were quite simple. That means it's possible that the Sanskrit branch of Chinese history was more advanced, more advanced. So this is the current thinking, okay, but not, not subscribed by all. That Sanskrit is not as old as Shang, Sanskrit is older than Shang and maybe even older than Aluto culture, which is about uh, 2000 BC. Now, if Sanskrit Dui culture was so advanced, then the question is, where did they come from? You know what I mean? Now, some human remains at Sanskrit Dui were taken for tests in DNA tests in 1986. That's when DNA first appeared. And till today, the results of the test have not been revealed. Some people think that, oh, maybe they found that the origins were from uh, ancient Sumer. Uh, or current day uh, Iraq, and so maybe they want, they want to tell the world because you know, a lot of history is very political. China doesn't want, maybe doesn't want people to know that their origins were from, not from China, but from elsewhere, Middle East especially. But uh, metallurgical science has actually sort of not proven 100%, but demonstrated that the copper alloys in Sanxing Dui were quite closest to those in ancient Sumer. Ancient Sumer. Mm -hmm. See, this is the timeline, Bronze Age timeline. This is Shang, Aluto. Now, where could the Sanxing Dui people uh, got learned their copper alloy techniques from? Can be from the South America and this. Then they found that the composition is not the same as those from India, and it's not the same from Egypt as well, but it has more similarities with those from ancient Sumer. Okay, so the question is, okay, Alotol is here, Sanxingdu is here, ancient Sumeria is here. Now, ancient Sumeria started at bronze craft making year about one thousand, more than a thousand years before uh, Sanxingdu or Alotol. So, but how did they come from here all the way here? Well, what what's divides the two regions is this, uh, the steps. You now the steps is a big place, uh, Eurasian steps, and uh, could they have traveled from steps all the way down to China, and Sanjing Dui? Well, it's possible because this. Saima Tobino uh, culture, they discovered for, for many years, really, they had a lot of uh, settlements along this area. Settlements that were uh, scattered stone settlements, and some of them nomadic, some of them turned to agriculture, but most of them uh, along the, the whole uh, Eurasian, Eurasian steppe route. They had nomadic lifestyle, a bit like what Mongolians had, okay? And another thing which we found 100 years ago in Tarim Basin. Tarim Basin is, well, uh, is uh, a place that they found, it's all abandoned now, but they found that there are a lot of mummies. And when they look at studying the mummies, they found that all the mummies there had very Caucasian features, okay? And of course, they call them white traps of ancient China. So maybe that was part of the journey from ancient Sumer all the way down to uh, Sanxing Dui. So this brings us second origin theory of uh, origins of Sanxing Dui. That is actually the Sumerians you know, who brought their culture, their bronze making skill, their Brass making skills all the way to Baldun, and then from Baldun all the way to Shu Kingdom, and then San Dui. It is possible. Because you look at it again, this is the San Dui Museum. They have these spears, and they're actually very similar to the ones from 
the spears on the Altai Mountain. Altai Mountain is way here, Sanskrit is below, and this was the journey which these ancient Sumerians would go before they come down to Sanskrit. So there are a lot of similarities. It also explains why, why is it this Sanskrit doing heads? You know, they all had pierced ears, usually not found among Chinese. But in China, in Han Dynasty, they would depict foreign merchants with pierced ears. So maybe this Sanskrit people were actually foreigners. And look at the Sanskrit tree. It is very similar to the Sumerian tree of life. You know, a tree branches, the branches of a tree normally go up, but uh, not the Sansing Dui tree and not the Sumerian tree of life as well. It goes down. Now, this Sumerian tree of life is supposed to be a religious symbol uh, that connects heaven and earth and men. Now, if ancient Sumerians were one of the ancestors of today's Chinese, then it's possible that. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein could be one of my distant relatives. Around 2000 BC, this Eurasian step route uh, sort of transitioned to the Silk Road. And so, in a sense, the Sanskrit people were cut off and developed on their own. They developed on their own until 1200 when they disappeared. The question is, why did they disappear? Well, apparently when they found the two pits in 1986, a lot of things were smashed and then buried and then they all left. Uh, it could be because somebody attacked them. You know? But they decided to smash that stuff, bury them, and then ran away. So there are a few reasons why, okay. One possible reason is because there, there was probably, probably an earthquake around the year 1200, okay. Minjang River. Minjang River used to flow somewhere near Sanswing Dui. Of course, you know, for ancient civilizations, a river is very important. But there was an earthquake, earthquake landslide, and then the river was diverted. So the new Minjang River is goes near Chengdu. And so San Chengdu became uh, uh, devoid of a river. So it's possible that an earthquake around that time diverted the Minjiang River. And so the San Chengdu residents found that they couldn't do support their living anymore, so they had to leave. After all, Sichuan province is prone to earthquakes. In May 2008, there was a major earthquake and 88,000 people died. This was around the Beijing Olympics. Now, where would they go? Well, there are two possible places. One is they move to the Northeast and to the Southwest. If you go to the Northeast, then you join the Shang culture. And maybe that's where all the skills that they had from Sun Tzu Dui were brought to the Shang culture, especially metalwork crafting skills. Because Shang bronzes suddenly became more beautiful and sophisticated from the 12 or 1100 BC onwards. Amazing. Or they could have moved southwest to a place called Jingsha, which is where the diverted Minjia River went to. So these are the two possible sites that this uh, uh, Sanskrit people could have migrated to. Because at Jingsha, a lot of artifacts there were very similar to the Sun Tzu Dui artifacts. So, Sun Tzu Dui, after the earthquake, some moved to Shang Dynasty, northeast, and some moved to Jingsha, which is in the southwest. And of course, Jingsha, in later years, reverted back to, they call themselves Shu Kingdom, and then uh, they lasted until about uh, 2,000 years ago. Because in the year, 316, uh, the first emperor of China conquered the uh, Shu Kingdom and made it into the unified China. 
Now, let's come back again to the news on 20th of March, when they announced new findings. Actually, what happened was that in 1986, they found two pits of all these antiquities. But then in 2019, they found six more, one, two, three, four, five, six more pits. And of course, a lot of halabaloo uh, uh, about it because it's uh, uh, so unusual, the mask, and uh, no one has seen it, such things before. They recovered more masks, okay? And uh, one thing I'm going to sort of highlight, in 1929, when the Shu Kingdom City are found, there were no masks, no artifacts, maybe because Shu Kingdom is a bit older and not so sophisticated. In 1986, they found two pits and there were a lot of masks. In 2019, they found six more pits and a, a bit more masks were found. So the question is, how did I get my mask, or oh, my father get his mask? In the 1970s, when China only discovered Sun Xingdui in 1986, okay? I mean, for a long time, we scratch our heads. How is that possible? Oh, maybe it's just uh, not possible. Here, here's another one of my masks. It's about two feet high, 65 cm. And this is an even bigger mask. It's about three feet high. So I put three batteries there to give you an idea how big this is. Huh? It's quite amazing. Here's some more. This is a little uh, bronze figure in the museum, 14 cm. I have one that's about 85 cm high. And here's another one. In the, in the museum, there's one 14 cm. Mine is quite big, 70 cm. Now the question is, are mine fakes? I mean, that's always I want to ask. But how could the fakers produce them in 1970s before the world saw them in 1986? That's the big question. So anyway, we just left it aside. Uh, it's just because in life, there are many puzzles you will never answer. Like where is your missing sock and all that? You will never find the answer. But in year 2000, I think our, 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 puzzle, our puzzle was answered because in February 2001, they found the Jingsa site. This is where they found equivalent Sanjing Jing artifacts. Okay. So obviously, ours came from there. Okay. And uh, how is it possible? Well, when they discovered this in Jingsha in 2001, the whole place was looted. Okay, looters had already been there. So, okay, maybe uh, the things that my dad bought were from Jingsha rather, rather than Sun Xing Dui. Okay, how did my father get in? Well, my father was a businessman in China in the 1960s and 70s. And at that time, um, that was during the Cultural Revolution. Now, during the Cultural Revolution, as you know, uh, everything capitalist, anything bourgeoisie, anything that is uh, reeks of uh, capitalism will be destroyed or condemned. So those who were uh, rich landlords, intellectuals, they were all condemned. And artworks were all destroyed. Even religious artworks were destroyed. It was in this climate that my father, who was then a scrap metal merchant, Okay, bought all this stuff from them uh, and brought it back to Singapore in the 1970s. And I've kept it locked ever since and I didn't do anything about it. So, questions why didn't I do anything about it? Well, I suppose my father died a long time ago. So, my, the question is well, I was too, you know, too busy chasing after my career or chasing after women to bother about looking into the bronzes. But there's also another uh, possible answer. Uh, for a long time, or since the year 2000, I was also concerned that China considers this as looted items. So did my father take them out? Uh, well, uh, but he took it out in 1971. So it can't be, but still the concern was there. And then in November 2007, a chance meeting happened. This is my friend, Charlie. He, uh, he was being filmed by Channel News Asia for a documentary on his seed carving. 
Now, Charlie has got this amazing seed covering. It's actually made of uh, uh, all sorts of seeds that could, that they, they carve it. It's an ancient uh, craftsmanship. Uh, okay, you know, it's just for a single seed. You can imagine you can make all these doors and boats and all that. Uh, you can see his seed museum at the Salvation Army at Tangling Road. It's, it's there, it's open now. Now, of course, we all, and I myself, they're not claimed to be experts. So we approach Professor Big Sick, I mean, to, to see whether uh, my bronzes were anything. Well, Professor Big Sick is not an expert in bronzes, but he knows 14th century bronzes. And he looked at mine and said, mm, it's, there's something to it that's worth exploring. So from that basis, Channel News Asia decided that they want to spend uh, $350,000 to do a documentary on how I got my bronzes. Of course, in this documentary, you must interview a lot of people. And one of the first person they interviewed was this dealer, uh, Christian. You know? he, he was in Singapore. He came in and he said, oh, no, this is all fixed. Okay, without observing it. Okay, he was quite rude, but anyway, that's him. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, but then he's a dealer. And what do you expect dealers to say? Uh, even if he's uh, the best experts can always get things wrong. For example, this Salvatore Bundy painting by supposed to be Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, uh, today, they're still questioning whether it's by Leonardo da Vinci. So, well, Chinese is very kindly kind of, uh, arranged a few trips. One of them was to go to Britain. Okay, so we all went up there. We spoke to this uh, bronze expert, okay, uh, Lazarus, and he said that looking at the, you know, we couldn't bring the actual bronzes to Britain because the customs said if you bring in, we'll confiscate it. And of course, Chinese station cannot smuggle in, right? We won't do that. You know? So they said, no, okay. So we brought photographs. Just based on the high magnification, magnification photograph, this guy said that it looks okay. You know, it looks okay. Then we spoke to many experts on Chinese history, like the Cultural Revolution and all that. Uh, in fact, four of them. Uh, but I mean, they could tell us many things about the Cultural Revolution and all that. But they couldn't actually tell us how the bronzes or the artworks came out because they didn't actually look at the artwork migration, migration during those days. So we were not no better off. But we had the privilege of meeting British sculptor Andrew Lacey. He is in the he's in Devon. Uh, he was in Devon, now he's in Wales. He just moved to Wales, he told me. Uh, and he looked at the photographs and he said, well, this is, is, uh, is not easy to make. Then he demonstrated to us how bronzes were actually made. You know? The process of casting bronzes is very laborious, even by modern day standards. You have to make the negative and the positive, okay? Put them together, then pour in the molten bronze. Then when it's cast, you break off the, the molds and then you start again. So he's saying, uh, for instance, I have this horse. Okay, he said, since a long time, all bronze sculptors have always wanted to uh, cast a broad horse with one leg standing. Okay, now why? Because there's a lot of Science involved in the sense that look, if you have it wrongly, the weight wrongly, after a while, the leg will break. Okay. In fact, that's exactly uh, what's happened now. There's one famous flying horse in Gangsu Museum. Okay, it's a bit smaller, but mine is much bigger. According to some experts I've spoken to, mine could be 200 years before this uh, later hand, earlier hand. Because in the earlier Han, they make bigger pieces for emperors. Now, just to just show you, demonstrate how difficult. In the year 2000, when, when China was about to join WTO, when China and US were good, uh, were good friends, 
the city of Xi'an got a craftsman to make one flying horse and give it to the city of Lexington in Kentucky. Okay, seven years later, the lake broke and the city of Lexington had to spend about $38,000 to repair that. Now, no. the year 2000, craftsmen in Xi'an couldn't make a flying horse that stays in one piece. Whereas 2000 years ago, the craftsmen could, could do that, imagine. This Andrew Lacey also said, this is not peace of mind. I put a bottle of wine there just to give you an idea how, how tall it is. Now he's saying that, you know, you look at the details, all these little holes here and all these designs in putting up the, the negative and uh, the positive cast, you must have have all these designs there. And it's not easy to, to do it. He's saying that it's almost impossible to find someone today who can do it. Okay. So another thing, look at this uh, bronze head. The, the bronze head is only about, the, the walls of this head is only about two millimeter thick. Now, it's not easy to make them so way, so thin. There are three ways, okay? Number one, you beat them up. You beat a piece of bronze. But looking at all my bronzes, there are no beat marks around, okay? Secondly, you solder it. But then there are no soldering marks in my bronze pieces as well. Thirdly, you cast it. But that is a skill which not many people can do it today. If you go to the museums in China and buy those replicas back of bronzes, you find that their skin or their, 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 their skins are very, very thick. Unless it's easier to make them. Okay. So it's maybe something like making eggshell porcelain. No? Eggshell porcelain is defined by its thinness, right? And the skill to create bronze with such thin skin is lost now. Again, the question, are they fakes? Well, you know, just a few days ago, there's this story about, from New York Times about this antiquities dealer. He makes fakes, sold it in the New York, Manhattan, and then his workshop, oh, where he turns out all this uh, 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 fakes were just a few blocks away. Okay, imagine uh, it, it was the factory process. But you see, looking at how difficult it is to make uh, bronzes, all the heat, almost a thousand degrees and all that, it's not easy. It's not easy. And, and why would you want to produce capitalist art in the 60s or 70s? You know? When at that time, it's a, it's a crime. Remember during the Cultural Revolution, why would you be so stupid to make things, such things when there's no market for such things? So it sort of gives me some confidence that, okay, like probably mine isn't uh, fake or reproduction because, I mean, I have, I have small pieces, but what I'm showing today are all the big pieces because I am more confident that the big pieces are real just on the fact that you make small pieces, reproductions, and you sell to tourists. But when you bother to make big pieces, and tourists don't buy big pieces, you know what I mean, that's all. It, it. Anyway, we had a great time at Devon. And uh, so the next trip was uh, to go to Bordeaux in France for to visit a, an art testing laboratory. It was headed by Dr. Oliver Bobin, nice chap and his team. We had a great time. But his results came back a few weeks later as negative. So of course, oh, I was quite disappointed. How is that possible? You know? But then I also realized that actually there's no agreed scientific test that determines the age of metals. So his lab didn't test the, the age. They were look, trying to look at it through indirect evidence. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't get a copy of the test report because Channel East Asia said that they, could, they don't want to give it to me. So I don't know why, but I didn't want to question uh, Channel East Asia. Now, like for instance, you know, this is steel, right? What they do is they try to see what is inside. And what they found that in my bronzes, there were zinc in them. 
No, then he, he came to the conclusion that zinc cannot uh, cannot be that old because China only started using zinc from the 17th century. So my pieces is not two, three thousand years old. It's probably only about four hundred years old. Well, too bad, but if that could be the case. But this guy, Christopher Fountain, has written many books about this. He says that ancient Sumer were the master craftsmen when it comes to all copper alloy. And if he is, if you believe him that ancient Sumer were masters of copper alloy techniques, then if ancient Sumerians travel all the way to uh, Sanxing Dui, then it's possible that that technique of making uh, copper alloys also ended up in Sanxing Dui. But then for the documentary, you know, you can't create a documentary without any scientific test, just interviews with different people. So I suppose Channel News Asia felt that, yeah, we must have a test. And so we did, just as any cancer treatment is better than no treatment. The last trip uh, was to go to Xi'an. Unfortunately, Channel News Asia was told that don't bring Kiwi along because uh, it could be dangerous for me. So I didn't go there. When questioned, the Chinese officials said, oh, the bronzes were fixed. And no antiques were sold to foreigners. That's the, that's the statement. Anyway, too bad. That's what they say. What can I do? So CM, CNA team was shown of the latest excavation from 2013. A lot of bronzes. Okay. And there's one particular one. This 3,000-year-old food vessel called Gui was discovered in 2013. And then only a photo was shown to the public in 2017. Okay, fine. I mean, it takes years for all these discoveries to come out to the public. A, day late, a, few, a few days later, I went to my storeroom and clearing up, throwing things away. And guess what? I found a gui exactly like what they were shown. When I told Channel News Asia their jaw drop, how is that possible? I mean, could I have made it in two years? Unless I have, I'm the best uh, bronze uh, artist in Singapore with my workshop in Juro or something like that. Huh? But anyway, I got this in 1970s. See, the whole thing, the whole exercise was to find out whether, hey, are these things fixed or not? If they're fixed, I'm going to throw away. I don't keep them. I mean, they're no value to me. I'm not really a, an artist or anything like that. But at the end of this journey, I am really still very confused. Initially, the document, I mean, this is what we discussed with Channel News Asia that, hey, uh, we, we will end up with balance because we are not experts. We talked to a few people, six people. Three said yes, three said no. But we are not experts, so we better don't say that they are real. Okay? But uh, something unexpected happened. The program date was booked for 6th of November, six months ahead, in around March. Uh, and uh, at the last minute, within the last month, uh, Wang Qishan, which is China's uh, anti-corruption man, uh, was supposed to be a keynote speaker at a Bloomberg conference in Shanghai. Then last minute, was diverted to Singapore. And he tried to make it a state visit, and he was here, he made a visit, paid a visit to our president and our prime minister. So, but this, this last minute event put CNA in a very good situation. How can you show, broadcast a program that put China in a poor light? So one month before that, they decided to maybe make some changes. And remember I told you that there are six people we interviewed. Three was positive, three were negative. And so they put it in such a way that it, it gave the viewer the impression that it was, they, they, those were fixed. Huh? I mean, I was disappointed how they order it. But then I, I can understand Channel Nation totally. If I were the Channel Nation boss, I would do the same thing. Hey, this is nation's reputation at stake. 
this is more important than just a stupid documentary about a man's bronzes. Okay, so disheartened, I left it as that. But a year ago, I stumbled on this 2008 book. It gave the answers that I want, especially in chapter 15. You can find this book in this National Library. This guy, Jasper Becker, said that since 1949, the Chinese government has been encouraging citizens to destroy their artworks, bring it to the, donate to the government, and then it was sold to foreigners to raise cash. And Westerners, Western dealers know this as a great Chinese art fire sale throughout the 60s and 70s. You know, you go, could go to warehouses full of furniture and just buy from them. And a lot of Western dealers did that. During the Cultural Revolution, this, this wholesale fire sale continued. Red guards would go from house to house, house to house, searching for artworks, and then they would confiscate them, and then they would uh, uh, put them in warehouses, and then invite foreigners to buy from them. So if those of you who remember in China in those days, there are a lot of friendship stalls. This is where you could find a lot of these uh, Chinese antiques, but you must pay US dollars. I mean, Jasper Becker's account is not the only one. China Daily, which is the official mouthpiece of Chinese government, also had a few reports about such things. In one 2015 article, they mentioned this about people bringing in their antique bronze sculptures, dumped on the ground, and then reduced to liquid metal. So it's not, it can't be fake news, okay? And then when uh, China was opening up, the sale of artworks continued, okay? Um, the government bodies were competing with each other to sell artworks. At one point in 1982, the Cultural Relics Bureau complained that the art, they were people who were selling antiques by the prices, by the weight, but furniture by the weight, artwork, paintings by the weight. Imagine all the loss. Yeah? And then when they ran out of uh, artworks, confiscated artworks for sale, local authorities would get uh, organized teams of people to go and loot from, from tombs and then sell it to the foreigners. This great art sale uh, continued until 5,000 years of Chinese antiquities were emptied. And of course, since the 90s, when Chinese economic picked up when the art lovers appeared, that's when uh, that was the end of the great art sale. Today, the best uh, Chinese museums for Chinese art will be all in the West. Okay. So remember when the Channel News Asia asked the Chinese authorities that whether my bronzes were sold? They said no. Well, maybe not true after all. In fact, since the year 2000, China has turned around. Since the year 2000, China now says that all your antiques outside are all stolen. In fact, the truth is that they were sold by the Chinese authorities. And certain, certain Chinese artworks like bronzes, they always have this mantra. If you ask any Chinese expert, they say, oh, no, these are all fakes. I mean, that's my experience. You know? I suppose it's like, uh, the, the, the successful boss, female boss, who had to guard her reputation. She wants to hide the fact that maybe when she was young, she had a, a legitimate child. I mean, but this is perfectly normal. And I can understand the Chinese, you know, when they try to control their history. So this book by Jasper Becker has been valuable to me. It goes to show, answer two questions. Number one, was it that my father uh, take part in the looting? Definitely not. It seems like he more or less bought it from them. Okay. In fact, I'm now more confident that my bronzes are not junk. Next, what are we going to do next?
well, maybe after COVID is over, I'd like to have an exhibition. Uh, I'll find a place to do an exhibition so that Singaporeans can have a look before I uh, do the next thing. Okay, so this is just some pieces which I can show you, which I will include in the in the uh, exhibition after COVID. Okay, this is uh, oh I've shown you this before, and I want this is a bull from Shang Dynasty. Look at it, how intricate it is. Can you imagine putting the negative and positive pottery together, and then pottery must have the, the exact details, and then pour molten bronze in, and then break it when it's dry. This is a big piece, okay? Look at the intricate. Again, I'd like to put a bottle of wine to give you an idea how big it is. This is another piece. This is uh, an ox, okay? And this is another piece. This is a, a U or what they call a, a wine vessel. And look at it, that's so intricate. Well, I suppose the mixed step is maybe donate to a museum, whoever wants it, okay? I suppose my father wanted, this is my father's wish anyway, he wanted the world to appreciate the craftsmanship of ancient Chinese. Because he has been through well, many things. He's, a, he's like all our fathers, they're all patriots you know, of their motherland. So my father is a patriot of China. You know, and he wanted the world to see how China can be sophisticated as well. Because remember, he was alive at a time when China was being bullied by the colonial West. So were many other countries in the world, okay? And he has seen Chinese starving uh, to death because there are no food. I suppose he hoped to see China, uh, Chinese flag flying again. Uh, well, if he were alive today in the year 2021, I think he would be quite happy to see the Chinese economy has, in fact, re-emerged. All right, so that's the end. Let me stop sharing. Dr. Ten, thank you so much for this absolutely fascinating talk. It's such a drama and detective story. Great way to start the week. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Thank you so much for like, guiding us and uh, through the history of the San Sidway bronzes and sharing your very personal story. Um, and of course, for the allowing for the beautiful slides, for allowing us to glimpse at your amazing collection. And uh, we already see some uh, messages from our audience that we are greatly looking forward to your this exhibition after the COVID. We want to see those pieces. And uh, I remember myself watching this uh, CNA documentary and uh, with every speak, I was keeping my fingers crossed, you know, say yes, say they're, they're real. <laughs> please, please. So. Um...